Well, welcome back, everybody, and good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Kathy, for leading us. Um, I hope you had a, a nice lunch and that our blood sugar does not crash too much during this session. Um, we're grateful that we have this final uh, panel, Implications for Today's Church, um, here on this um, final conference of the year commemorating the 40th anniversary of the revelation on the priesthood and the temple. Um, I want to thank uh, those in the Maxwell Institute, uh, Africana Studies in the Department of History, uh, colleagues from here and far who made this possible. Uh, we began planning this event uh, many, many, many months ago, uh, well over a year ago, a couple of years ago. Um, one thing that I want to emphasize today in this final panel that it was very important to all of us here uh, affiliated with BYU, uh, students, faculty, staff, the community that we had this event during the school year when the students were here. And that's something that we're going to talk more about during this panel. Uh, I'm pleased that we have four wonderful panelists that I'll be introducing here in a moment. I have uh, a couple of tasks uh, ahead of me, um, three different things that I want to cover as I uh, introduce first our panel and then our panelists uh, today, this afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Jacob Rue. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Sociology here at BYU. I'm affiliated with Africana Studies. Um, uh, my research covers uh, housing segregation, racial discrimination in mortgage lending, home ownership, immigration, deportations, and the black and Latino middle class. Um, so the first thing that we want to cover, um, I had a couple of our uh, panelists comment on this already. The first thing, the first task that I have today is to talk about uh, why I'm here. We'll have the opportunity to hear from four um, impressive and insightful panelists about their journey um, to hear based on their training and expertise um, and to be edified by their experiences. So I want to start by um, letting you know why I am here today. Um, without the revelation on race and the priesthood in the temple, without the civil rights laws passed in this country to make racial integration possible that I experienced in school and in church and in my neighborhood growing up in a very segregated Chicago, I would not be here today. I would not be studying race. I would have never visited uh, the White House and the Obama administration. I would have never participated in civil rights cases. I would have probably never gone on the civil rights seminar uh, with many of my colleagues and students here at BYU. Uh, it is most likely based on the historical facts of this country that I would have disappeared more into uh, the white mainstream. I wouldn't have to worry about these things. It wouldn't affect me, the very definition of privilege. But because of these events that we commemorate today, it forever changed my life and put me on a trajectory uh, to be a part of this panel, which is an incredible privilege for me to cap off this conference. This is an article uh, from the 1986 Ensign Magazine. I got the scan PDF. If you go to the website, you're not going to get this version, right? So I got the original version here. We've all got our different 80s and 90s uh, hairstyles in effect. And I want to tell you that our first distinguished panelist, who I'll be introducing in a moment, um, Sister Kathy Stokes, um, Catherine Stokes, Grandma Kathy, many titles that she has earned, uh, rightfully so, that when I was a child, uh, as uh, Dr. Martin said earlier, in the late, late, late 70s, right? uh, when I was a child in the nursery, which is the part of the uh, children's program at church that cares for the infants and toddlers, when I was a child in nursery, my very first leader in the Church of Jesus Christ was Kathy Stokes, okay, as a child. And my first preschool teacher was uh, African American. My first Spanish teacher I had for four years was African American. My first coach was African American. Um, I had so many mentors, people in positions of authority and power that showed me that we are racially equal and who taught me right. People that were white, were black, 
who were Asian, who were Latino, who all fought for equality, and that made a big impact on me. Really briefly, my first memory of priesthood was the priesthood session way back, and I'd have to do the math, but this must have been the late 1980s, and we had a three-level building here that we met for uh, 50, almost 15 years of my life until we had a chapel. And we did not have a satellite dish, we did not have a video transmission for the General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that's twice a year. So we had a telephone transmission. And my very first memory of priesthood as a 12-year-old was a black Korean War veteran, Brother Lester Jefferson, who was the eldest form president, being so careful with that telephone and taking his glove in Chicago, it was still really cold in April, that's what I remember, and setting the phone on his glove so we could all listen at the microphone there. And we sat in this room and just listened to the transmission. So that's making me sound like the people that listen to FDR on the radio, I know, but uh, <laughs> it, was a, it was a remarkable experience and that's, that's what I remember. The way he took so much care in his calling and, the, and being a custodian of the building and being a custodian of the, the, the saints in the fold in that, in that congregation. Those were a couple memories. And I remember going to the temple for the first time and there being uh, an interracial group of people of many different backgrounds to greet me there in the celestial room, okay? So that's part of why I'm here today and I dedicate uh, you know, anything that I say to the, uh, to the late and great uh, Vic Soil, who's there with my father, the late Tom Roo, who worked together to make it the most racially integrated congregation in one of the most racially integrated neighborhoods in Chicago and um, to be a really remarkable time uh, in my coming of age, okay? Now this year we've had, I think, the historians can correct me, but I think there's been about six, a half a dozen conferences to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the revelation of the priest in the temple. And I just want to call to attention um, some of the themes that have arisen today that uh, I think rightfully so are something that I thought about as well. Uh, the idea of what does it mean to be one? Okay, and I hope that Kathy and others will weigh in on this today. What does that mean, right? Um, the very next day on June 2nd, our brother Kevin Mosley uh, shot back and said that when Dr. King was writing his letter from Birmingham Jail, there was a call to just be united and not rustle, ruffle too many feathers. And so we need to negotiate what this truly means to be one, because I think there's a higher meaning of what that means and to think about uh, pluralism and integration and equality um, and belonging and identity, okay? I want to... Uh, give a shout out as we say where I'm from, I want to acknowledge those who planned B1 and also the Black Legacy, the two conferences, both in Washington, D.C. and Salt Lake City. If we give a hand to those individuals who helped plan those. Events. We know from Sister Jimenez and others, uh, African American members of the church, that when they went up to Salt Lake and met with the brethren, they were a little bit taken aback that they said, I think this is what we should do. I think this is important. And people said, go ahead, do this. This is right. I think this is the time now that we seize on the importance of these issues. Okay, status update, as the young people would say, okay? So we, it's very important that we're here at BYU. And I will have people critique me on my slide design here that I put too much. Why have I done that? I've done that on purpose just to emphasize how much we have either started in the last five years or upgraded, uh, thanks to the people like Janisha and others who made perspectives a centerpiece. Uh, this next year, uh, Black History Month celebration will be all of January, all of February. We will go intersectional all of March. And you know we might as well invite some people for April, just go the whole semester, okay? Because where I'm from, Black History Month is bigger than Christmas, okay? Um, and so we're going to make this a celebration. We're going to make it multidimensional. We're going to continue the programming. And we're going to emphasize really importantly that there is something here for people of all races and backgrounds at BYU. Melanie spoke very eloquently earlier about Japanese internment. Many other experiences here where we can have interracial uh, dialogue and understanding and be edified one with another. 
So that's something that we're working with. And to be honest, people at BYU, we can't even take credit for everything on the screen, right? We know that what the law school is doing, the community involves other people, and we know that the Black Alumni Society involves many couples who are black alumni who nurtured that dream and started it. Uh, my dear colleague and recent graduate, Tanisha Zandamela, under her leadership, many years of racist opposition, saying you cannot have a club for women of color. You should not have a club for women of color. There won't be a club. And then when there was a club, we give this full institutional support. And that club, the Civil Rights Seminar, has funding in perpetuity that will last forever, that has now been institutionalized as a permanent course. These are things that will be with us forever. And now our choice is, what do we do with these things? How do we make it an environment for everybody to understand the importance? And I want to just call your attention before I conclude with my last slide uh, to the bottom, bottom portion of this and, and point out that when we went down to Selma on the Civil Rights Seminar trip, we had Native American students and faculty. We had uh, Latina young women from South Los Angeles. We had black Americans. We had Haitian Americans. We had first, second generation Americans. We had people, we had faculty and staff of all races. We went around from this, what we call in sociology, HWCU, right? Historically white college and university. And we were the most racially integrated group everywhere. And this gave me a glimpse of the promise and the potential of a true BYU education, to fulfill the aims of a BYU education. Um, so there's things like that that make me uh, also pose the question that I hope that we get to later on, what is the role for those who self-identify as neither black nor white? Because in many places in the United States, they are in fact the majority or the largest minority. And they have an important role to play in racial reconciliation and they have important histories that will continue to be uncovered and understood better as we expand pilot versions of the Civil Rights Seminar to include the Mexican-American and Chicano rights movement and many other aspects of history. So that's something that I want to definitely make sure that we talk about today, uh, that we don't leave out, because the history started out a certain way, that we don't leave out the present and the future. Um, and then the last thing, of course, is Go see Jane and Emma, the movie that opens tonight. I've, I've been asked to <laughs> say that again. It was a great film. And, uh, and finally, on October 30th, we will have um, an amazing, true American hero, uh, Mr. Brian Stevenson, uh, professor of law at New York University, executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative, and architect with his team at EJI of the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, which I was able to visit myself last month and have a be a sacred experience, a spiritual experience um, that I hope everybody else can have. But he will be here at the Marriott Center. We want to pack that Marriott Center on Tuesday, October 30th. Okay. So with that, let me just tell you a little bit about the enrollment, and then we will go to our panelist instruction uh, introductions. So these are four-year increments. Uh, I have not labeled them. Uh, this year is an estimate. It is a fully informed estimate. Uh, last year, there were uh, over 430 black students at BYU. Uh, this is a number that is quadrupled since I was a student in the 1990s. Um, um, our brother, Tacova Jackson Van, who's a, uh, an ordinance worker in the temple, uh, who gets a lot of interesting reactions from people when he greets them at the veil, um, said, uh, that's, I'll let him say more about that another time. But, uh, but he said, we need to flood white spaces, right? People of color need to go there in big numbers. And part of what I want to impress on your minds today is that we need to get past the stage of tokens and lonely pioneers and realize there are hundreds and thousands of qualified black, Latino, Asian American, Middle Eastern, Native American students out there in this country who are faithful members of this church or who believe in the mission of BYU and can come here and partake in this experience, and that there's something there for them, okay? I have had students who are from all over the globe, students who are from every different racial background who are also African American, and it has been a powerful experience to me, uh, and I have learned from them and become a better person from them. So I don't want everybody to think that we're all misty-eyed about, you know, when I was in the nursery, <laughs> but this is about the future, and I see a bright future in our students, uh, the white students 
who it clearly clicks to them. They really understand how their values speak to racial equality. And I think that everybody has a journey. So for me, this has just been an introduction, a little bit of my journey. And now I'm really pleased to introduce our four different panelists um, and be able to hear from their journey uh, and their experiences and their vision for the future. Um, Kathy, I'm going to call you Kathy if that's right instead of Kathy. Um, Kathy Stokes is a professional nurse who has held a variety of positions in healthcare in Illinois, including bedside nursing, office nursing, public health regulation, bioterrorism, preparedness, and response. She retired after 34 years of service in the Illinois Department of Public Health and now resides in Salt Lake City. She is a mom and grandma. The average age of her best friends is six. Okay, true more. <laughs> she is on a mission to get people to sing together with feeling and to be one. And she used to lead our congregation and lift every voice and sing the Black National Anthem, from the one that I know best. Uh, Marvin Perkins is the producer and co-author of the Blacks in the Scriptures DVD series, a resident of Los Angeles, California. He has been a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for over 29 years. Born and raised in Niagara Falls, New York, Marvin is a highly sought-after public speaker speaking on the topic of Blacks in the Scriptures and the LDS Church, race, and uniting the human family throughout the U.S. and around the world. He is also an accomplished vocal recording artist. He has represented the LDS Church in numerous news articles, internet, television, and radio programs. In 2009, he and Bishop Fred Bethel of Florida launched a national African-American outreach program that is helping many uh, overcome the obstacle created by the restriction on the priesthood. In 2016, the duo launched the B1, that's the number one there, project, the non-religious arm of their outreach efforts that helps to bridge the divisions, divides, excuse me, caused by race. Marvin works as a human capital management software sales executive. He is married to the former Andy Crespo, and they have three children. Ryan Gabriel, my distinguished colleague in sociology, received his BA in sociology from Utah State University in 2011 and earned his PhD from the University of Washington in 2016. He is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Brigham Young University, where he teaches courses on race in the US and social statistics. Ryan's research focuses on the processes of racial residential stratification, residential mobility, and neighborhood attainment and race. Deborah Alexis. Yes. And please give a shout out for Deborah for having so many reasons why. Let me just tell you real quick that when I taught race and ethnicity, we had a special section of the class that had about 90 students. It was a it was a wonderful semester. And Deborah would ask these PhD level seminar questions that were so good. And I would say, ooh, I want to talk about that but we will leave the rest of the class behind. We won't cover this material. And so instead, I've hired her to be um, a TA for my class, and as a wonderful writer, a wonderful person, who is doing so much good that I will tell you about here in her bio right now, but just a wonderful uh, example of the many students I've had at BYU who have made me a better person, a better scholar. Deborah Alexis was born in the US and raised in Haiti until her fifth grade year. Her move sparked her interest in the etiology, etiology of race in America and her passion to eradicate racism. She is studying sociology with a French minor and Africana studies. She is the vice president of the Women of Color Club at BYU and the communications director of Girls Lobby, a nonprofit she and her friends created that teaches high school girls to reclaim their voice in politics. And what a better time for that. Um, Quick announcement, really quickly, at the end of this session, those who are participants, there is a shuttle that will take you to your hotels at about 3.45, they will board and leave between 3.50 and definitely by four o'clock, so 3.45 for that. In terms of the question and answer, let me give you a layout of what will happen uh, here going out. Each panel participant will have about 12 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes, I will be keeping time. Following that, uh, their uh, presentations, I will ask just one question. I was gonna to ask two, but I decided just to ask one. Okay, I know we get in the afternoon last panel here. And then we will follow the same protocols we did in the earlier panels. Those who wish to ask a question, come come up here to the front. The Maxwell Institute facilitator will have a microphone for you. Please ask your question in the form of a question. Please be brief. Please be courteous. 
If applicable, please direct your question to a specific panelist, and please relinquish the microphone to the facilitator after you've asked your question. And if you have more follow-up, we invite you to please visit with the panelists. They are signing books, they are taking selfies, they are changing lives. Um, so please meet with them. <laughs> meet with them after, after the panel. We've had a lot of book signing requests today, so that's one thing that stuck with me. Um, so we are going to go in the order uh, as, as presented in the bios. And just to recap, before we give our round of applause, we'll first hear from uh, Sister Kathy. If you want to go ahead and make your way up now whenever you're ready, Sister Kathy will speak to us first. Uh, then we'll hear from Marvin Perkins, uh, will be second. Uh, then we'll hear from my colleague, uh, Ryan Gabriel. And then we'll hear from Deborah Alexis. And this is very much by design that uh, Dr. Gabriel and Deborah will be getting the last word at our very last conference here at BYU. It is fitting that they get the last word uh, before we go to our question and answer. So with that, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Sister Kathy Stokes. She waited breakfast the next morning. We go to Thanksgiving dinner at the Sun, my missionary's house. We get tired of the kids. We come back. We're sitting around watching the telly, drinking our Diet Cokes and Mountain Dews. And uh, 
the dad says, now Kathy, now when anybody uses that tone, I think, oh sweet Jesus. <laughs> now Kathy, you're a person that sees the big picture. I said, well, I try. Well, in the big picture of things, aren't you glad your folks came here as slaves? And I said, are you crazy? <laughs> His wife was rolling on the floor. She had read 12 Years a Slave. Well, he says, look at all you've accomplished. I said, yeah, but if y'all had left my black behind in Africa, I might own a diamond mine and be a queen by now. <laughs> Well, yes, that's true. Now, I laughed all the way home. I couldn't get mad at him, and let me tell you why. If I said to him, I, I, I have a, a bill that I need to pay that's $800, and I don't have it, either he would go get the checkbook or ask his wife to and write the check. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that he loves me, no doubt in my mind. We are one. Because I think being one means taking what is, where I am, where you are, and working through that, coming to it with the commitment to work through whatever it is, whatever hang-ups I may have. See, one thing we're all, you know, we, we all know about the grievances and the sorrows of black people at the hands of white people. But we don't know the notions that black people hold about white people. Because when I was a little girl, I used to think, because I heard somewhere, that when white people get wet, they stink. And so I would get on the streetcar, and if it was raining, I'd try to see. Well, somebody must have smelled a wool coat that got wet, and from that, the lie started that when white folks get wet, they stink. They do not. <laughs> uh, but my point is, Never mind getting irritated, or get irritated, but reconcile. I think the purpose of this life, one of the major purposes, is reconciliation. I'm reminded of that from an experience. I'm a child of the South, Mississippi. If the world needed an enema, that's where they'd stick to two. <laughs> that's what it was like when I grew up. I went back to Mississippi for one of my brother's funerals, and uh, it was in a country church. No organ, no piano. They just sang, baby. Not sing. They sang. Okay. Um, and this tall white man came in and asked my nephew, for permission to speak at my brother's funeral. And I sat there, my mouth dropped, because I never thought I would see a white man <clears throat> ask permission to do anything from a black person in Wilkinson County, Mississippi. Um, the man said he came to represent his own father who was on his deathbed, who wanted him to bear witness of the goodness of my brother. My brother had been a valet. Now, you all saw the help. Well, those black folks were working for the middle class white folks, because the rich white folk, the help lived in. My brother was one of those. He was a valet for the old man who owned the county, the bank, the stores, all the people, sidewalks, everything. Um, I was so struck with that, I tried calling back, calling back, I never got a hold of him, and then I made another trip south for another reason, and I went into the store that bears his name and asked for him. He came out, I told him who I was, 
And I said, I came to thank you for saying the nice things you said about my brother. But more than that, I want to thank you for asking permission. And he started to cry. And he went on to talk about how much my brother meant to him. And then I started to cry. So here we are in the middle of the store in Woodville, Mississippi, and not a cash register is ringing, not a person is breathing hard. All eyes are on us. Because here stands this tall white man and this old black woman crying. Reconciliation. It's where we have to come to. Okay. So, being one is hard. It's, it's not an easy task. But if in fact we are of Christ or of any religion that teaches the same principles, and most of them do, then we must grapple with the notions we hold that some of us don't even know we have. And we have to be patient and help each other. You know, I, as, as tired as you can get of not the smartest questions in the world, you have to gird up your lines and reach out. I have to reach out. Now I'm not I'm not promising you may I get a strong reaction. But then I have to follow that with an outpouring of love. If there's one thing we must all do, I think the advice given in section 121, I in verse uh, 42, um, I wrote it down, but I got my things out of order because I answered Jeff's, I mean, uh, Jacob's question. Hmm. Anyhow, it's kindness, persuasion, gentleness, love and faith. Don't stick Jesus on folks. You know, Jesus won't like it if, no, please don't do that. Kindness, gentleness, persuasion, love and faith. If we would do that. Now to the task at hand. Okay, in six minutes or less, let me review for you that <clears throat> this 40th anniversary B1 uh, we came, the committee of 10 people, and uh, I would like to tell you it was a love fest for every meeting, but it wasn't. We fought like dogs at times. But we all came together <clears throat> in unison that the program should be directed toward those peoples who were deprived by not having the priesthood. That would have been Brazil which was the driving force for the question being asked. America, Mother Africa, Caribbean. And that the, the program should focus on that. And the very, you know, we send it over to, as they say, the brethren. Um, and the next day, they said yes. And see, I didn't believe it because it takes longer than that to get anything back. So my guess is they had already come to that conclusion and they were happy that we came along and they could put it on us, right? No. So with that, things moved ahead and that program was put together in less than three weeks. The actual, now I said in the beginning that we are, somebody ought to sing somewhere there's a place for us. And so the person who was the staff person in charge, oh yeah, that sounds good. He called me three days later and said he had a call from Gladys Knight. And Gladys said she had a dream that she was in the conference center singing 
somewhere there's a place for us. And so he said, I guess we're going to have, there's a place for us. And so on with the fun. It was a magnificent event. There have been few, in my knowledge, there only there was a, an acknowledgement of the declaration on the 10th anniversary. It was a seminar here at BYU. And Elder, um, the first counselor, the judge, Oh, yes, Oaks, Dallin Oaks, spoke on that program. And I spoke on that program. And then there was the 25th anniversary that I think the Genesis group did, and they did it in the Tabernacle, and Gladys was here for that. And then we had a 30th anniversary one in the Tabernacle. I was here for that one. And then there be one. Now, prior to that time, well, the only one that was called a celebration was the 40th anniversary. The significance of that event was that the first presidency claimed it. Some of the committee members got hung on up on somebody and said, you got to understand the significance of this. They have never owned it before. We've had commemorations, we've had whatever, but they never celebrated. And the invitation said the first presidency and Gladys Knight invites you to. <laughs> Who needs the priesthood, right? <laughs> so, um, I want to also point out that we have to always keep in mind the, per the reason that Revelation came about. It was because of Brazil. The is what drove President Kimball to ask the Lord. We all have benefited from the revelation that was asked because of Brazil. And we're glad to do that. Now, what, in fact, is the future? Implications for this? Well, I got to say, the major thing is numbers. Numbers matter. On the day B1 was taking place in the, in the conference center, Africa baptized its 600,000th, 600,000 member. It is the fasting, fastest growing missionary effort in the history of the church. So the revelation was sought because of worldwide evangelism and going forward worldwide evangelism again I think will be the driving purpose. Numbers count. Um, As important as numbers are, it is also important to remember the significance of history and experience. That the experience of what happened here in America is important. And I thank the History Department for all that it does to tell our story. That we not lose that in the crush of the numbers. The most important thing that I think that needs to happen is that the people of color of the church, we need to get our act together. We need to do away with resentments, uh, whatever kind of feelings, attitudes we have, whether someone should listen lazy or not, and whatever. Did you notice this morning the differences in style, and yet the quality that just oozed from the presentations of our people from Africa and Brazil and uh, South Africa. I don't want to lose any, leave anything out by mistake. Forgive me. I want to be one. But we need to get our act together. 
See, the Polynesians were not affected by it. And so they kind of stepped back from us because, you know, they, you know, they, they the lepers, right? They don't have, they can't have the priesthood. Well, that's done. And we don't need to be resentful because they weren't, op have open arms. We need to reach out and love one another. We need to be knit together in love. If we, the people of color, will do that, the rest of it will already be done by virtue of our example. I, I, you know, if I were going to be a real old lady, I would say, I'm not going to live to see that. The hell I want to live to see it. Okay? I'm 82 and I want to live to see it. So get busy. Be one. Thank you. truly humbled by it. Um, I love the effort. I am grateful that we've had so many speakers because everybody has a story, right? Everybody has a story and you got a chance to hear um, so many different voices and every voice is important. And so even if they come from different perspectives, um, those perspectives can reach a certain group of the people. Um, but every perspective leads to the same, right? Uh, being one. So uh, I'm excited about it. Um, uh, I, uh, September 11th was my 30th anniversary in the church, and I've been doing this work for 30 years. My whole passion, uh, after being told that I was cursed and I could not inherit the celestial kingdom, but I should join anyway, and that I was a son of Cain and seed of Ham and all of that, um, I'm like, Lord, you, you can't possibly want me to join this church. There's just no way. And, um, and he said, yeah, I do. <laughs> and uh, so I did. And then I started finding answers. And ever since then, for 30 years, I've been working on trying to reach people who would be receptive to the message the Lord would give me to take forward. So hopefully uh, that resonates with you. Um, the very first thing I was taught was about Elijah Abel. Um, and I said I knew it. If there was one African American who was ordained to the priesthood, then the restriction was not of God. It couldn't have been. And so um, I have put myself in a position where I would say, Lord, if I'm cursed, I want you to tell me. Um, if the restriction was right, I want you to tell me. I'm just open to whatever you would want to tell me. Uh, and, and that's what I will turn. You just confirm that into my heart and my mind and my spirit, and I will take that forward. And so I was very pleased when he told me that I wasn't cursed and that that wasn't right and so on and so forth, because it was going to be hard for me to go to my family and tell them the same things that the folks were telling me as they were trying to get me into the church. So um, let me see if I can get through this in 12 minutes. But uh, there is a thought uh, that I want to... Um, um, be the theme over this particular uh, presentation, and, and that thought is dealing with um, what Jesus had to say, the first and the second great commandment, uh, and that first great commandment uh, was to love God with all the heart, mind, and soul, uh, but the second was like unto it. Now, I don't have a monitor up here, so I'm forced to try to put my glasses on and read from all the way down there, uh, just so I can get the scriptures right or read the screen, so forgive me, but the second is like unto it. He told them to love thy neighbor as thyself. Now what's really key about this is verse 40. And I have that highlighted in yellow. And he says, 
And upon these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so to me that said, if this is truly of God, if something, if a teaching and a principle is truly of God, it will match up against the first and the second great commandment. Anyone that doesn't, I know for myself, not of God. I can't accept it of God because this is Jesus Christ giving us this instruction here. All right, so uh, also, let me see, is that working? Yep. That's Matthew 22, 39 through 40. Uh, uh, we've had a lot of conversation about race, and I think the best way to get rid of racism is to help people to understand that it's a man-made creation. Uh, this is the guy who actually created the concept of race. His name is Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. Uh, he was actually graduating from med school in 1775, and he actually created the class system for the human family. Um, this is 1775. Uh, the scientific community was so fascinated by his work that they published it in 1776, and Blumenbach became known as the father of scientific anthropology. He was actually building off of the earlier work of this gentleman. This is Carl von Linnaeus. He goes by a few different names, but Linnaeus was the first that we have documented that's trying to classify the human family into a system that can segment and separate them. So many people believe that God actually created races, and they he didn't. It was actually created by this German guy. You got it right here. He created the class system. <laughs> And um, what's kind of interesting is that when you think about it, there actually are no black people. We're brown. There are no white people. You're just lighter brown. And you can tell when you go out in the sun, you get tan, you start to get a darker brown. Uh, in our firesides, we don't have time, but we show scientifically how skin color changes. It's a sign of the Lord's love to protect us as we move around the world that he's created for us. So basically, I don't use the terms black and white because I think they solidify in someone's mind that we're actually different. I believe it's dishonest, and I don't use it personally. So I never use the terms black and white uh, relative to man. So also thought number two uh, comes from uh, President Nelson. I mean, he was Elder Nelson. Uh, even if everyone is doing it, and I'll say saying it or believing it, even if they are, wrong is never right. So I've made a covenant to find out what is true and take truth for it. I don't care about earthly customs. I, I, I don't care about those at all. All I care about is keeping my covenant to the Lord. All right, so with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about priesthood. So uh, in thinking about priesthood, there are some widely accepted views and some widely taught views that become a fabric, part of the fabric of uh, our culture. But um, you'll see as we get through the actual doctrine, which is in the scriptures, that uh, it, it conflicts. I mean, there's conflict, and so how do we get to be one? Well, we meet at the feet of the Savior. We can best do that by understanding the Scriptures and the words of the prophet. We pray about them. We get a confirmation from the Holy Ghost, and that leads us to that oneness. And so let's take a look at some of the Scriptures and the teachings that we have uh, regarding priesthood. Uh, so first of all, we teach a plan of salvation, that we live with our Father in heaven. He, he wanted to give us all that he had, so he created this plan, and anyone who wanted to take part in the plan got a chance to get bodies, uh, to come to earth, uh, to be tested, to accept the testimony of Jesus Christ, and then to get uh, the ordinances through the priesthood in the temple uh, that would actually allow us back into the presence of the Father. And so if you restrict the priesthood, you've pretty much restricted the plan of salvation. It is of none effect. Okay? So that's in our most basic teaching. You can understand the priesthood was always meant to go to all. All right? And so let's look at uh, what the Lord commands regarding priesthood. So uh, let's take first in... Um, uh, section 1, I believe this is. All right, and I've got dates of these as well because there's a lot of comments about praying for, you know, they prayed for a long time for, um, you know, for this to come and it didn't come. I want to show you that uh, it appears that Joseph was these either doing one of two things, either praying about who to give the priesthood to, or the Lord was just giving it to him over and over again. And you can see that it happened at least 12 times within a two-year period. So with that in mind, let's go to... Uh, um, uh, November 1st, and he says uh, uh, why the Lord commanded the priesthood to go all after this one. The weak things of the world shall come forth and break down the mighty and strong ones. That man should not counsel his fellow man. He didn't want us taking counsel from man. 
Uh, neither trust in the arm of flesh. One of my biggest concerns when I joined the church is how dependent the members were on flesh and not on God. They had cultural testimonies instead of spiritual testimonies, and I knew that could only lead in a departure from what the Lord wanted them to do. All right? And so in verse 20 says, but that every man might speak in the name of God the Lord, even the Savior of the world. And so the Lord has always had the intention, and he put it in the first book of commandments, of building the restored gospel for all to have the priesthood. And if you follow the footnote on the word speak, it takes you down and tells you topical guide authority. And so we'll have more confirmation as we go on. Uh, what qualifies one for the priesthood? Therefore, if ye have desires to serve God, ye are called to the work. That was the qualification. And if you follow your footnotes there, you'll see several other scriptures that we will cover that make it crystal clear that they were talking about priesthood. So here's at least two commands already to give priesthood to all, and we're still in 1829. All right, um, the next. Uh, and faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye single to the glory of God qualify him for the work. So what qualifies him for the work? You see it right in front of you. Uh, brothers and sisters, if, I mean, this is the book of instructions for building the restored gospel. If the Lord has given them a book of instructions for building the restored gospel, I don't have to look back to the Old Testament to see. I can, what did the Lord have to say about priesthood here? He actually only says one place in all of Scripture that these people cannot have rights to my priesthood. But he even says, I'll even forgive them if they repent, and I'll show you those as well. So if you follow your footnote on the word qualified, down you can see topical guide, priesthood, qualifying for. So crystal clear that the Lord has always attended and spoke. Now, these are revelations where we have the text of the revelation. Some revelations are just come with a feeling. Some come with text. These have text to, this, to these revelations. All right, and they've been here. All right, so more uh, guidance on who should receive the priesthood. And you can see the dates next to them. Yea, whosoever will thrust in his sickle and reap the same is called of God. We've got it in DNC uh, 6.4, uh, 11.4, 12.4, and 14.4. You see the dates, April, May, May, and then again in June. So something is happening. The Lord is either telling him over and over again for a specific reason because he understands there's a great inequality of man and woman going on right now, or Joseph is continuing to ask, and the Lord is saying, yeah, over and over again. All right, so let's move on. I just got the two-minute warning, just like in football. All right, so uh, here's Doctrine and Covenant 36, verse 4, 5, and 7. Look how important this is. Now, this calling and commandment, the only place in all of Scripture where that's listed as a calling and commandment, that as many as shall come before my servant Sidney Rigdon and Joseph Smith, Jr., embracing this calling and commandment, shall be ordained and sent forth to preach the everlasting gospel among the nations. Uh, let's go to C DNC 36, verse 7. Uh, and this commandment shall be given unto the elders of my church, that every man which will embrace it with a single note singleness of heart may be ordained and sent forth, even as I've told you. I've already told you this. All right? And check the dates there. Uh, more clear guidance. Um, and that every man should take righteousness in his hands and faithfulness upon his loins and lift the warning voice unto the habits of the earth and declare both by word and flight that the desolation come upon the wicked. DNC 60, uh, 6337, uh, we've got more in 57, and again, verily I say unto you, those who warn, those who desire to warn sinners in meekness, and in meekness um, to warn sinners to repentance, let them be ordained unto this power. All right? Um, again, we follow the footnote A for those, just in case you have any question of who those are. And really clearly, all the scriptures we've been going over so far. Uh, more guidance on priesthood. The 68.8, uh, go ye into the world and preach to every creature acting in the authority. And look at the authority, uh, which also says priesthood, which confirms what we read in DNC uh, section 1. Um, 
And here's 121. Here's the only place in all the scripture where the Lord says, they may not have rights to my priesthood, talking about those who are persecuting the saints. But then again, see in section 124, verse 50, he says, I'll even forgive them if they repent. <coughs> all right, so uh, Joseph was obedient to the Lord's command in giving priesthood. So there were people of African descent that were holding the priesthood uh, for 17 to 22 years, plus we were ordaining. And uh, let's see if that flows through. Here's just a few of those names and the date of their ordination. And um, 17 years, we started the restriction once we got into the Utah area. And we made it official on my birthday, February 5th, 1852. So I always like to say I was born to do this work. Okay, great. All right, so in closing, let me share this with you. Um, 1852 is when we officially started the restriction. Um, and in doing so, we put up one wall. And that was the policy that people of African descent could not be ordained to the priesthood. Um, as a result of the policy being put up, we created teachings within the church. That created a second wall. And the teachings, blanks or curves, da 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 da, da you, you, you've seen it all. Uh, then also, um, what did that create? And we've heard it from our other speakers. The attitudes, don't preach to them. Uh, it's not to go to the Negro. Um, uh, they're less than, they're cursed, they're getting what they... I, all of those things, those are the teachings that were in the church. So what does that create amongst the members? Well, that creates attitudes. What create a third wall? So here we are, we've got three walls of restriction. We've got policy, we've got teaching, and we've got the attitudes. What... When you have those type of teachings, when you have that type of policy, when you have those type of attitudes coming from the membership, good people, what else do you have? Well, you, you have perceptions. You've got a fourth wall, which is perceptions. And now these perceptions that are held by not only people of African descent and other people of color, but anybody who has any idea that God is no respecter of persons, well, you, you create perceptions on what the Church of Jesus Christ the Saints, is, uh, Latter-day Saints, is really all about. Well, with that in mind, uh, in 1978, we actually uh, took down a wall. We took down one of the walls. Now, here's an excerpt from Declaration 2. And in my mind, this gave me peace and comfort. So no matter what the members were teaching and no matter what they were saying, I see an admission here. It says, as we have witnessed the expansion of the work, uh, we've been grateful that many people and many nations have responded to the message of the restored gospel and have joined the church in ever-increasing number. Now listen to this. This, in turn, this activity has inspired us with a desire, something they didn't have before, to extend to every worthy member. And I don't see anything about the Lord there. I see them saying... We now have a desire because of all this activity, Brazil and everything else going on. It's right there in Declaration 2. It reads the same in your book as it does in mine. But that gave me some peace, and it matched the other scriptures that were there as well. So to summarize, the priesthood is essential to the plan of salvation. Um, we, had, we had the text of at least 12 clear and direct revelations from 1829 to 1831 to give the priesthood to all who would embrace the gospel. Uh, and finally, and uh, we have the text of uh, Official Declaration 2 that appears to indicate clearly what uh, the uh, new language of the church is now. So we've had it back then and we have it coming now uh, in uh, the official, um, uh, in the race and the priesthood essay and some of the other language coming from the leaders. So uh, what I'm saying is this in closing, is that we eliminated uh, one of the walls. But until we teach the saints, here we are 40 years later, and, and members, they really don't know this issue. They can't speak to it at all. As a matter of fact, some of them, because they believe, they don't want to go anywhere close to thinking that their prophets might have made mistakes, that they won't even consider this. They won't consider learning from the scriptures that tell you clearly what the truth is and what the Lord intended well, those teachings will remain in place, so will the attitudes, and so will the perceptions. So with that in mind, I finish by saying that the restriction is still in place. It is still in place. We've only taken down one wall. And until we can clear up the teachings and make sure every member and the next generations know, 
and that won't change the attitudes, then until those two change, the perceptions will not change. And uh, thank you. Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is relatively small. We represent about 0.2% of the world's population. Despite our diminutive size, we've been commanded, as we read in Matthew, to teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Likewise, in Mark, we are implored, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. However, as we all know, the church for a time did not preach to all people, particularly those in Africa and her diaspora. In 1978, everything changed and all the blessings within the church were bestowed upon every worthy individual and the missionary efforts to blacks throughout the world began in earnest. Currently in Africa, as Kathy noted, there are roughly 600,000 members Given that the church does not track race and ethnicity information on its members, we're unsure as the exact numbers, but we can assume the majority of the 600,000 members in Africa are black. Here in the U.S., we can also be sure that the number of black saints are continually growing. This wonderful growth of the church amongst these populations is truly delightful. I'm sure it's exceedingly delightful to the Lord. Despite this wonderful news of a growing black population in the church, there are, unfortunately, brambles that black members must navigate. Typically, there's a moment in the lives of black saints where the history of the priesthood in the church hits them with force. Some are able to navigate this history without too much trouble, but for many others, however, when confronted with this history, despite the marvelous 1978 priesthood revelation, Suffering emerges. Some black members who are born in the church, they might come to know of the church's priesthood restriction towards individuals of African ancestry once they leave their parents' home or maybe serve a mission, as we've heard today. Those who convert in adulthood might stumble upon our church's history regarding race in an internet search trying to find black members of the Lord's church. Or they might hear from non-member friends or family in each of these scenarios, black individuals are shocked to learn that, for a time, individuals of African descent were barred from the blessings of the temple and that black men could not hold the holy priesthood. Not only does this fact shock these black saints, but if they continue to research the topic, they're also confronted with objectionable comments from past church leaders who asserted a multitude of reasons, many you've heard about today, for why many priesthood blessings were withheld from black women and men. Blacks were the descendants of Ham, predestined for servitude, or the blacks were less valiant in the pre-existence. Other challenging folklore was perpetuated during this time of the priesthood restriction, such as black skin being a curse. Learning this history can leave some black members feeling overwhelmed emotionally devastated and confused. They are left wondering how such statements can be uttered in, a, in the Lord's church, a church they love with all of their hearts that has gifted them real and tangible blessings. Ultimately, the constellation of challenging feelings that many black members experience around this topic, I believe are tied to one central emotion, shame. While well, guilt is an emotion that you've done wrong, shame is an emotion that you are wrong. Shame communicates that you are unworthy of love. Standing in opposition to shame 
is the fact that the Lord feels and has felt deep love for all of his sisters and brothers. It is clear in the scriptures that Christ loves and has loved all of us equally and is no respecter of persons, and that he denieth none that cometh unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female, all are alike unto God, both Jew and Gentile. These two competing facts, the priesthood restriction and knowledge of and experience with the Lord's love, can easily lead black members into a state of cognitive dissonance, where they're pulled emotionally and psychologically in competing directions. Despite it being totally understandable for black members to be shocked about this history and having many rightful questions about it, some might feel guilty for questioning the priesthood restriction, that they're unfaithful <coughs> for doing so. However, amongst this pain and heartache and confusion and shame, there are wonderful blessings available to black members that can lead them to a greater place of peace and happiness and strength. In a 1996 conference talk, Elder Richard G. Scott discussed the concept of compensatory blessings. Where in reference to the Lord, Elder Scott states, to the sightless or hearing impaired, he sharpens the other senses. To the ill, he gives patience, understanding, and increased appreciation for others' kindness. With the loss of a dear one, he deepens the bonds of love, enriches memories, and kindles hope in a future reunion. These compensatory blessings that Elder Scott references are but an example of an amazing principle that can help us as black members work our way through the church's history with race and help us ameliorate any feelings of sadness and shame. The greatest compensatory blessing available to us as black members in relation to the priesthood restriction is that we can draw near unto Christ. Christ was severely derided in his mortal ministry. We know this. We can, through our suffering with the priesthood restriction, come to understand in some small way the suffering that he felt. We can turn to him in utmost confidence that he can succor our pain, our confusion, our shame, because as Alma states, Christ suffered pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind. That this, that the word might be fulfilled, which saith that he will take upon him the pains and the sicknesses of his people. And that he will take upon him death, that he may loose the bands of death, which bind his people. And he will take upon him their infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities. Indeed, we are his people. Another compensatory blessing available to us as black members is that we can grow in compassion and forgiveness through understanding the complex historical context within which the priesthood restriction was instituted and maintained, which we've all learned so well today. The church was restored during a period of immense racial stratification and segregation. Slavery was the primary economic driver in the South, and racial segregation and white antipathy towards blacks was rampant elsewhere. The highly racialized context within the church, or within the church uh, was restored is um, also coupled with the fact that prior to the inception of the church, the foundations of racial differences that asserted blacks as inferior were created and in many ways accepted as accurate scientific knowledge. For instance, another shout out to Johann Blumenbach, all right, German medical researcher, published in uh, 1776, a typology of humanity that split humans into five groups, which we saw. Caucasians, Mongolians, Ethiopians, Americans, and Mays. With Caucasians at the top of the hierarchy. This unscientific typology and others like it created distinct racial groups that were supposedly natural. Out of this hierarchy, scientists began to develop theories that all human behavior was tied to racial categorization. 
and that the human race could be improved for the regulation, through the regulation of birth. Known as eugenics, this pseudoscientific endeavor had numerous proponents, where here in the United States, from the end of the 19th century till the 1970s, thousands of African Americans underwent forced sterilization with the goal of lim eliminating natural inferiority of the lower races. 1970s. Besides this forced sterilization, blacks endured lynching, residential segregation, convict leasing, economic discrimination, and other forms of immense suffering at the hands of individual, state, and federal actors whose implicit and explicit aims were to maintain a system of white supremacy. The priesthood restriction and its maintenance happened in this broader context. It is important to make clear, however, that there were many abolitionists, along with fully racially integrated religious congregations and social organizations during the institution of the priesthood restriction and its maintenance. With this historical under understanding, we can, as black members, better contextualize the priesthood restriction and its maintenance and be filled with a greater understanding, which is really the bedrock of forgiveness. In turning toward, rather than away from the priesthood restriction, we can gain an increased faith in the process of revelation and the words of modern prophets. When, Spen when President Spencer W. Kimball Kimble read the official declaration too in 1978, it wasn't a declaration crafted overnight. Biographical documents confirm that President Kimball actively worked and supplicated the Lord for an extended period of time to obtain the revelation. He wanted that revelation. Also, in 2013 conference, Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf acknowledged there have been many times when members or leaders in the church have simply made mistakes. There are many, excuse me, there may have been things said or done that were not in harmony with our values, principles, or doctrine. I suppose the church would be perfect only if it were run by perfect beings. God is perfect and his doctrine is pure, but he works through us as imperfect children, and imperfect people make mistakes. And at the recent B1 event celebrating the 1978 revelation, President Russell M. Nelson stated, to applause, I might add, that we realize that the only comprehension of the true fatherhood of God can bring full appreciation of the true brotherhood of men and the true sisterhood of women. That understanding inspires us with a passionate desire to build bridges of cooperation instead of walls of segregation in the house when why? When he said those words. All these statements indicate that we are part of a living, breathing church that is growing and improving. And although we still encounter racial slights, small and large, both inside and outside of the church, there can be gratitude for the racial progress that has been made. Additionally, we can be immensely grateful for, for what I consider to be the divinely inspired work of black religious figures who fought for civil rights. These individuals, such as Dr. Martin Luther King and Fred Shuttlesworth, united around the cause of Christ to hold the nation accountable to its founding creed that all men, and I say women, are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with a certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We can look forward in faith, manifested through our collective action and total commitment that racial progress and racial justice will continue to be made among us. What I'm suggesting is that we don't have to remain in a state of pain and suffering in regards to the priesthood restriction. Of course, we can and should mourn for those amazing saints who endured in the gospel but could not obtain temple blessings in their lifetimes. We can and should mourn for those who fell away because of the priesthood restriction and its emotional burden. However, for us who remain, there are gifts awaiting in the pain and suffering surrounding the priesthood restriction if we seek them. 
To do this, we must do our best to emulate Christ and his beautiful, glorious atonement when he suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross of Calvary. He went towards suffering rather than shrieking from it. The good news for us is that when we move towards our suffering, we are not alone. He is with us, aiding us, lightening our load, lifting our spirits. Thus, the solution is not turning away from the priesthood restriction and ignoring the past, but toward it with a womanly and a manly confidence and conviction. This idea of moving towards our challenges in order to be liberated by them is echoed by the renowned Roman emperor and Stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius, who stated, the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. For us, as black members, I suggest we study and pray about the history of the priesthood in the restored church so that we may discern the difference between what was human and what was divine. We as black members can't deny this history any more than we can deny ourselves. This is our genealogy. This is our ancestry. Let us take this past and turn it into our present strength and peace. This principle of searching out compensatory blessings does not mean, however, that we allow others to disrespect us or to discriminate against us or malign us in any way. It does point us, though, to a way that we can transform what was and what is into useful resources rather than sources of defeat and despondency. What I'm not suggesting is that we undertake a form of mental contortionism but establish a thorough understanding that the heart of suffering is happiness. Or, as the venerated Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh states, no mud, no lotus. We need to have mud for lotuses to grow. The mud doesn't smell so good, but the lotus flower smells very good. If you don't have mud, the, lo the lotus won't manifest. You can't grow lotus flowers on marble. And we, as black people, we have real experience, metaphorically turning mud into lotuses in both small and large ways. We made makeshift basketball hoops out of coat hangers and basketballs out of gym socks. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and we stood up to barbarous authoritarian figures who worked with all their might to deny us equal rights and in our demonstration of nonviolent resistance, we asserted our beautiful humanity. In closing, the priesthood restriction in the 1978 revelation will always be with us, my sisters and brothers. We have no reason to fear it. We have no reason to run away from it. I hope we remember that we can stand for justice, that we are a beloved part of the Lord's church, and that he loves those that love him. Thank you. shoulders today and I'm really really grateful um, for their support that I'm able to stand here today in front of you um, and yeah let's just jump straight into it rêve moi pour demain devant jour ce rêve demain qui doit plutôt en accord vite tête ensemble misère rien va servir fait pas plus l'histoire pour corriger des voies demain Nawel va servir pour ma clanque. Pour coucher sous papier, j'ai grain à manger ailleurs. Pour génération qui tout petit, accepte qui gagne pour qui gagne pour un premier soleil la vie. Après bon et deuxième siècle chaviré, la continuer mettre en grain, à finir, la pépinière guinéenne. Pour continuer par contre, pour continuer par bon récolte, la séclairage des années, l'orgueil à quelques 
dans le jardin nous, pour nous simer dans l'amour. De voir pour reboiser la carrière à belle fleur pays. This week, my intro to Africana Studies class explored what it means to speak. And we concluded that to speak is to be understood. When I opened with this poem in Haitian Creole, I'm sure many of you wondered what's going on. <laughs> um, and I'm sure that some of you leaned in, squinted, straining your necks in hopes of catching the words that fell from my lips. Try as you might, if you don't speak Haitian Creole, you didn't understand the poem I opened with. So, did I speak if you did not understand me? Or as it happens more frequently in this distracted world, did I speak if you didn't listen to me? Today, you have listened to many presentations and to many stories and as we near the end of this conference, I ask, did you lean in, squinted, straining your necks in hopes of catching the words that fell from our lips? It should have been easier because we spoke in a shared language, but I must ask, did we really speak if you did not listen? A great example of this dialectical process was shown to me in a video from the race and ethnicity course here at UIU. We all know and watched as the nation split itself yet again along racial lines when Colin Kaepernick chose to sit during the national anthem to protest police brutality. When US Army veteran Nate Boyer saw this, his initial response was anger. But upon further reflection and acknowledgement of their different lived experience, he chose to lean in and strain his neck to have a better understanding of Kaepernick's intent. Veteran Nate Boyer wrote a letter to Kaepernick, and Kaepernick reached back. It was US Army veteran Nate Boyer who suggested to Kaepernick to take a knee rather than to sit as a sign of protest. The political climate has been encouraging us to draw deeper into our camps and engage in trench warfare with no end in sight. I know we can do better. A dear and brilliant friend of mine beautifully said, one of the most important words in English and in the scriptures is remember. Imagine, I imagine that the world is chaotic and wicked because we forget too soon. We forget patience, we forget love, we forget compassion. We forget that no man is an island, that we are all connected through life, end quote. So how will you change after today? Will you forget? I ask this because it's disheartening to attend these conferences, rife with hope for a better future, only to be thrown back into an ignorant and insensitive environment. Will you correct the false justifications for the priesthood ban in the classroom, with your friends, and at the dinner table with problematic family members long after this conference is over. And I know some of you may be thinking, do I really need to correct Aunt Gertrude? <laughs> and the answer is yes. Because when I'm at the temple, Aunt Gertrude will lean over and tell me, just think, when you get to heaven, you'll be white just like me. So yes, please, correct Aunt Gertrude. Passive attempts will not dismantle the problem either. One of the most used passive at attempts that I've noticed members espouse is colorblindness. As an aside, I find it interesting that people seem to forget that they are colorblind when discussing my admission to BYU, but that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> passive tactics like colorblindness is what American political sociologist Benil Silva focuses focuses on in his book, Racism Without Racist. When you don't have the words to communicate a problem, it goes unresolved. We're not having these conferences for fun, or for a key. We want to fix this problem. We want to be one, but it will take work. And it will take language, which I've emphasized and underlined is really important. Colorblindness is often used to dismiss the plight of people of color. In sociology courses, we learn that race isn't real. It is a construct 
that was developed to justify the abhorrent subordination of a people. We should all be aware that if, but we should all be aware that if men define a situation as real, the consequences will be real. H. Richard, H. Richard Milner, director of the Center for Urban Education at the University of Pittsburgh said, said it best. I'm someone's father, I'm someone's husband, I'm someone's friend, I'm someone's son. But I'm also a black man, and my being black shapes my experiences. And so you, if you are not attuned to the part of my being that is race, then it's very difficult for you to understand and respond to my humanity. People attempt to absolve themselves from the problem and thereby remain complicit, complicit and complacent when they say, I don't see color. Thank you, Rosa. <laughs> to this I counter, how can you embrace someone fully if you disregard an integral part of them, like their skin color? Our doctrine teaches us that we are spiritual beings. But we, are very, but we very much dwell in the physical space. We cannot simply disregard skin color because it affects how we interact with the world and how the world interacts with us. My dear friend continued to say, I believe Christ tells us to remember quite often in the scriptures because in that remembrance, we push ourselves beyond this fallen world and into a life once lived with God in deity, where we remembered each other's worth and divinity." End quote. Ladies and gentlemen, I am not Mormon first, or black first, or woman first. These are things that I am simultaneously. So I cannot be in alliance with people that do not acknowledge all of me, while these identities are constantly conversing and working and blending together within me. BYU is not yet my dream school, but I would like it to be. It is one thing to increase the admissions of the students of color, but retention needs to be maintained to truly change the status quo. And I would say that the same goes for the church. It doesn't, care that I, I, it doesn't matter the numbers that you reach for baptism. If those members do not feel at home, not feel welcome in their ward, this, the baptism was meaningless. It does, they won't stay. Retention is important. I want people of color who attend this school, and I would add this church, to feel empowered, valued, and supported. And I do not want people of color to have to carry this load alone. It's disappointing to watch people lose interest or roll their eyes when I mention these issues in class and in church discussions. It starkly reminds me I'm alone when it comes to this. All the while, white alliance and assent are expected of me when discussing Mormonism. However, I can see the tides changing, slowly but surely. We're having forums about race on campus, courses, seminars, cultural celebration, and plenty more in the works. It gives me hope that when we graduate, we will leave BYU as better friends, spouses, employers, employees, because we took the time to be uncomfortable, to learn and grow. And you know, maybe one day, BYU will finally be my dream school. I hope you leaned in today. I hope that you gave us the chance to speak by listening. I will invite you to listen to the English translation of the poem that I read at the beginning. So please listen so that I may speak. Dream for tomorrow. Dawn is tomorrow's dream, which should be imagined in togetherness. The pages of history will bury yesterday's misery in hopes of correcting tomorrow's duty. The ink will lie heavy on paper for the growing generation and the ones who are to see the first ray of light. With the turn of the 20th century, we are to continue to nourish the nursery, to continue yielding good crop. Let us uproot the weeds of pride and selfishness in our garden, so that we may so love, so that the best flowers of this country 
may make this house a home. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Marvin. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, especially Deborah. That is how you close the conference right there. Um, we are over time. We want to invite those who have questions to please come up afterward and ask the panelists. They still have about a half an hour until they board the bus. Those who are going back to the hotels, continue the conversation. Do not wait until the next anniversary. Do not wait 10 years. Talk to your child, talk to your family, talk to your friends, and let the healing begin. Thank you everybody for coming, and thank you again to the sponsors and all those who helped. Have a good day.